Hello, everyone. Welcome to the course entitled, Do You Know How to Prune? This course is good for one North Carolina landscape contractor's technical or landscape credit. It is given, it is given the course number of 2163. So it is good for one credit for the North Carolina Landscape Contractors Licensing Board's landscape or technical credit. It is not approved by the Irrigation Board, nor has it been approved by the Pesticide Board. This is good for one NCLCLB um, course, one hour. And there will be a short quiz at the end of the, uh, of the lecture that you will need to take and pass. Now, also during the lecture, we will, we will stop and have like a check on learning. These will be a question that you will need to answer within the quiz that may or may not have anything to do with the lecture. This is one way that the licensing board is making sure that you guys are watching the lectures all the way through. Now, when it comes to pruning, do you know how to prune? One of my favorite topics and one of the life lessons and landscape lectures that I learned at a very, very young age. My parents, you know, run a landscape contracting business. My mother and my aunt were the ones who actually showed me how to prune. I learned firsthand from two ladies who really took pride in what they did uh, when it comes to hand pruning. We never, ever used mechanical or gasoline-powered hedge clippers at all while I was a youngster growing up in the business. We did everything with loppers, and we did everything with bypass uh, corona pruners, and I still carry a pair of those with me every single day. Now, pruning, it is an art form. It is also a science, and it is something that I think you personally can make good money at working by yourself or working with a small crew. Landscape contractors could actually offer this service uh, to a lot of other landscape professionals who may or may not want to do uh, hand pruning. And so it is, it is a good uh, niche to be a part of. And there are clients out there who are willing to pay top dollar, uh, high dollar hourly rates uh, to get their plants pruned, you know, the correct way. Now, guys, I'm not going to lie to you. There are times that you need to get out the gasoline-powered hedge clippers. Nothing wrong with that. It just depends, you know, what type of uh, setting or what type of job that you may be on. Commercial work, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't lend well for hand pruning. You've got to get in there, get done, and, and move on to the next one. But when it comes to the residential market, there are people that will pay for hand pruning, and you just got to, to learn how to market it and go after that type of work. So let's go ahead and jump into the landscape lecture. Do you know how to prune? We've got about 42 slides to look at through here, but uh, a lot of good information. And so with our introduction, pruning is the most frequently misunderstood, and it is misunderstood, and it is also a critical function in directing the development of plants to fulfill the intent of the landscape designer. Now, let's look at this picture down here below and <laughs> kind of rethink that statement that I just said to fulfill the intent of the landscape designer or landscape architect. Do you think that these hollies down here in this picture, is this what the designer intended for the plants to look like? I would, <laughs> I would doubtfully think so. I would not want any of my customers yards or designs that we've drawn look like these below. Now, some people are going to like this. And, and again, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just, I'm just talking about the correct way we need to prune and the services that we should offer. Again, there's clients that's not going to pay for the hand pruning and you got to go in there and get this done. But the one thing that you need to do with this picture right here is go in and do a landscape renovation, either rip them out or cut the hollies back every so often. They, they respond well to hard pruning and let them come out naturally and let them kind of start over 
But proper pruning techniques requires time and understanding of the plant's habit, the biology, and the function of the design. Now, if we were in a formal garden setting, this type of pruning would be okay. Are we going to do it with hollies? Sometimes. A lot of the times we're probably going to be using a boxwood when it comes to those formal gardens. But it, it all depends on what the intent of the designer was. If it was a formal garden, we're going to be getting out the hedge clippers and we're going to, you know, cut them in, in hard rectangular shapes, box shapes, or whatever that we need to do. We want to fulfill the intent of the designer. But guys, if you've listened to some of my pesticide classes, you know, we're always talking about knowing the biology of the pest that we are targeting. Well, we need to know the biology of these plants. And if you're taking all seven credits with me this year, you're going to see a course uh, entitled Identifying Hollies in the Landscape. Now, so many people don't know their plants. That is the first step in proper pruning is knowing what the plant is. I've had way too many customers, clients tell me, well, we had a landscaper out last week and they called, they called these hollies boxwoods. Eric, these aren't boxwoods. These are, these are compacta hollies. Well, well, Miss Smith, I know that. And I'm sorry that the landscaper that you called last week didn't know that, but in a way I'm glad they didn't because that's why I'm standing here talking to you. Know your plants, know the biology, know the habitat, and then you can properly prune for your customers. So why do we prune? Well, the primary reason for pruning is to maintain the size and natural form of landscape plants. The key word there, natural form. When you get the hedge clippers off the truck, you're not going to prune the plant in a natural form. You're going to make it look like a soccer ball. You're going to make it look like a beach ball there in the client's yard. You don't want to do that. I could watch my mother and my aunt, Sylvia and Carol. I could watch them take a residential house, take a before and after picture, and all you're seeing is a reduction in size of the plants. They are pruning it with a pair of hand pruners, such as the picture here. Looks like they're pruning some some Mahonia here. Um, but they would, all they would do is reduce the size of the plant. And that's what we need to do. We shouldn't change the shape of it. If we were to take hedge clippers to this plant right here, that's being pruned with, with a pair of hand pruners, it's not going to look like the same plant. Plus the leaves are going to die. We're going to cut it with the hedge clipper and it's, it's going to die. And that's something that we don't want to happen. We don't want that to happen. Keep the natural form of the plant. And all you want to do is maintain that size and reduce the size. Pruning also maintains the health of landscape plants by removing dead, diseased, rubbing branches, or even the damaged branches. Now, I know a lot of landscape contractors get involved in tree work. And a lot of our customers are going to ask us to do that. That's why I really recommend becoming uh, a certified arborist. I think that is one of the most prestigious besides the landscape contractor license is to be that certified arborist. For some reason here in the Winston-Salem area, people just respect that certification. You see a lot of certified arborists working in the wealthy areas, but There's a lot of good knowledge that comes out of that certification about the trees. One, tree identification, and then the disease and uh, insects that are going to affect it. But we as landscape contractors are going to have to take care of some of the smaller trees on our clients' properties. Even in a commercial setting, you know, trees will start to drop some of their lower branches, meaning that they will they will start lowering themselves just because of the weight. And so a lot of the property managers will want those trees limbed up. And some of those trees are going to start rubbing each other uh, during 
during growth, they're going to start causing uh, areas of decay where disease and insects can can get in. So you need to remove uh, any of the branches that are damaged or rubbing together. Now, the topic always comes up, crepe murder. People always ask, you know, should we or should we not cut the crepe myrtle? Guys, I'm going to be 100% honest with you. Um, it's not going to kill the crepe myrtle. You can't kill them. I mean, they're just they're an indestructible tree. So if the client wants them cut, cut them. Now, as a landscape contractor, you know, I am going to try to convince my clients not to. But if they want to, we're going to go ahead and cut them. Why? Why may you ask? Well, I don't want to lose the contract because I don't want to cut a crepe myrtle. Here's the situation. A lot of the crepe myrtles are planted in places where they don't need to be. They've gotten too big because, you know, the designer put them in the wrong place. And so property managers and homeowners are wanting them cut back for that simple reason. You know, if you're, if you're not into cutting the, the crepe myrtles, talk them into removing the tree and going back with something a lot smaller. But I definitely don't want to lose a contract because I'm not going to prune a crepe myrtle. It's not going to kill it. It'll actually, you know, produce better blooms a little bit later in the year. It's just one of those things. And the term is called pollarding. You know, it's been around for centuries. Our ancestors, you know, pollarded trees for different reasons. They never did it for aesthetic reasons. They did it for a survival, uh, you know, for they did it for survival. I mean, they literally cut the trees back like that so they could have, you know, abundant firewood. They also, um, you know, cut it back so that the sunlight could hit their, you know, handmade brick houses and warm it up during the winter time. And then when we do pull out a tree like this, you know, it creates that flush of growth. They use that flush of growth for extensive shade uh, in the summertime to help cool their brick homes. So, you know, all survival. You know, in France, they cut back all the trees in the parking lots like that because it'll create that flush of growth and it gets more dense and it creates more of a shade protection for the cars that are in the parking lot. So, you know, it, you know, who's to say we're right or who's to say we're wrong? You know, I'm, I'm one for it. You know, if you don't like it, get a truck that doesn't have your logo on the side of it to go and cut these back. But I, I'm definitely not going to lose a contract uh, because I don't want to prune a crepe myrtle. We were actually pruning in a Harris Teeter parking lot out in Clemens one time, and we met with a property manager. They wanted the crepe myrtles cut. And I'm like, all right. I said, I don't agree to it, but, you know, uh, we will do it for you because we have the contract. And she's like, well, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you telling me, you know, you know, your thoughts on it, Eric. But we have tenants that are complaining that drive-by traffic cannot see their signs. I 100% agree. If you're paying $2,000 a month, you know, for a small uh, retail center that to, to sell pizzas or to sell um, you know, any type of retail, you want people to see your signage on the building and on the large sign out front. So that's why we cut the crepe myrtles back. I had a master gardener, you know, pull in there and jump out of her car. And she came over and was just criticizing me for cutting back those crepe myrtles. And I mean, she just wasn't having it. She's like, I demand that you stop right now. And I'm like, well, if you want to, we will stop, but I need you to write me a check for the entire contract for the remainder of the year, uh, because I've got to feed my family. And she didn't like that. And she didn't like that. And another thing she didn't like is I went out to the truck and I got my portfolio, which had my, at the time, North Carolina landscape contractor registration board certificate, my certified plant material uh, certified plant professional certificate my pesticide license certificate and you know all the degrees that i had was in that portfolio and then all the the list of clients and pictures that we worked at so i'm like lady you're barking up the wrong crepe myrtle here i'm going to cut these so i suggest you go ahead and leave or write me the check don't call it crepe murder call it pollarding 
Pruning is used to train young trees to their proper form for future development. You do want to, you know, cut some of those juvenile branches out uh, that you may uh, think or definitely know are going to be an issue as the tree gets larger. You want to go ahead and actually uh, train the tree while it's while it's younger. Cutting some of the lower branches off, going in and thinning it out a little bit is also going to help that tree as it grows older. Pruning the spent flower heads or fruit encourages developments of flowers and fruits for the next season. You want to go ahead and cut them off. Plus, they look a little bad. We've had clients call us and say, hey, you need to come and deadhead. And, and you do. You need to come and cut the dead blooms off some of the flowers. They just look bad. And it helps encourage, you know, growth for next year. It also encourages flowers on plants which bloom on their current season's growth. You need to get there. Now, this goes straight 100% back to knowing your plants, being able to identify the plant, and then knowing the biology of the plant. You got to know these things, guys. Plant identification, I think, is one of the most important things that we should know as landscape contractors. We have to know our plant material, and we have to know our soils. But identification of the plants will help us learn how to correctly prune these plants. So, again, why do we prune? For one, safety. Safety can become a big issue with plants. And in commercial settings, you know, young women leaving a retail center late in the evenings, you don't want a place for any you know, criminals to hide that are going to grab a pocketbook that are going to grab your groceries. You want it lit up and you want people to be able to see. You don't want anything, any plant material for people to hide behind. With windows, you want, you want to be able to, to look out a window. Now, if it's a bathroom window, you may want it to, to kind of hide people being able to look in. But also think about this. If you were to put some type of thorny shrub underneath a window and you maintain its proper height, people aren't going to be able to get close enough to even look into the window. They don't want to get near the thorny shrubs. So there we can actually use a shrub in front of a window for protection that way. Also, I mean, look at the speed limit sign. We can't even see it because of the trees growing out in front of it. We have to prune that. We have to cut it back and allow visibility of all traffic signals, all traffic signs, or any type of information that needs to be passed along either to pedestrians or vehicular um, passengers. Power lines. How many times do we see trees planted underneath power lines that doesn't need to be there? kind of goes back to to uh, um, knowing your plants and knowing how fast they're going to grow. Now, if it's, if it's going to take 30 years for the trees to get there, you know, maybe. I, I'm always looking towards the future. I don't want, you know, someone else to have to come in and correct my mistakes. But there are people, especially in municipalities where there may be a donation uh, for for a uh, streetscape, and the, the donor wants these particular trees planted. We do a lot of Christmas lighting for, for municipalities and, and light these trees that – uh, are growing underneath power lines. And one particular municipality had these Chinese elms planted all down Main Street. And the power lines were real low going down Main Street, and these elms got up there fairly quick. And so they came in and they topped them. They looked horrible. They looked horrible. And so they decided to remove them all. They went back with a smaller looking 
crepe myrtle. They didn't go with, you know, the Natchez or anything like that that's going to get super big. They used a smaller growing crepe myrtle, and it's worked out nicely. Uh, but it allowed it allowed for visibility of the street lights. It allowed for visibility of the banners because the, the town was always hanging different banners based on the season and year. So uh, it was a smart move, but they planted the trees based on somebody else's decision that did not know their plant material you want lighting especially in parking lots to be visible you don't want trees to grow up and to block the uh, the lighting and exit driveways how many times do we we back out our landscape trucks from a client's house and we can't see and so we we start backing into the driveway so we can pull out and then we have to keep edging out and we're landscapers. We're going to prune it. But let's say we're at a neighbor's house or let's say we're visiting, you know, family members and they've got plants planted at the end of their driveway. You do not want any shrubs or plant material to block the visibility of oncoming traffic. You don't want somebody pulling out, pulling out and then getting hit, T-boned because they couldn't see the car coming. And this is more prevalent during the daytime. You know, because at night you're going to see the car lights, but during the daytime and the sun's reflecting and everything else like that, you may pull out because of the plant material and then get, you know, hit by the oncoming traffic. Structure damage to your house. You know, a lot of plants are rubbing up against the house and that's not good, especially some of these older homes that may have wood siding. Not good. You need to prune it back and allow that airflow to get in between the house and uh, the plant material. Pruning can maintain plants in unnatural shapes. Of course, you know, this is when I'm talking about formal design. Now I can dig this. I can dig this because I dig just about any landscape. I love visiting botanical gardens. I love the formal gardens, but if that's what the client wants, that's when we would prune it for that. This looks like it was designed to be that way remember we're 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 doing it for the owner's intent just like with the topiary shrubs down below you know it looks like a dwarf alberta spruce I and mean, forgive me if i'm wrong the picture's a little blurry on my end uh, but people will cut these type of trees uh into these shapes for topiary purposes you know at the end of the sidewalk or, you know, on either side of the steps going up to the front porch. Nothing wrong with that. Again, that is the designer's intent. So that's what we're focusing on. All right. Pruning is used to renovate old, overgrown plants and restore them to their proper landscape function and size. Of course. Here we have year one. We're going to remove one-third of the oldest branches from the base. Year two, uh... We're going to, uh, uh, after the pruning, the light and air can reach the center of the plant. Years two and three, you'll remove another third of the old wood on each of the following years. And then year three, all of the old wood has been removed to make room for new vigorous new growth. And I call it landscape renovation, rejuvenation, to go in and cut some of these plants back hard and, and allow allow new growth to come on and hollies respond very well to that. And so if you're getting a property, just sign the new contract and the previous landscaper, uh, you know, use the hedge clippers. You can talk your clients into cutting back hard these plant material and giving them that rejuvenation and making it look good. Our old Dean at the college, you know, when he first came on board, he hired us to go out and pine needle his yard, get some uh, plugging and seeding done and to prune back stuff because they had the house on the market. And the realtor said, you need to kind of spruce up your landscape. And so we did. And I talked to him. I said, look, sir, uh, these are hollies. You know, this type of this time of year, we, we cut them back. They're going to do well. And we cut them back and they were kind of bare. And his wife came home and she kind of freaked out. And so we had to write a letter stating, you know, with our stamp and seal that these shrubs are going to be 100% okay. And if not, we will replace them. Well, it wasn't, you know, three or four weeks later, you know, he called me back and said, Hey, the house is under contract 
And he says, you won't believe it, but these, these plants are leafing out and they actually look good. So nothing wrong with going in and cutting back hard. Pruning can reduce the shade and wind resistance. And you can see the before and after picture here of these diagrams. Uh, you want some of that wind to blow through these trees. That's going to help uh, stabilize it. And you're not going to, you know, lose the tree. If we've had, and, and it always happens here, we have a ton of rain and then the winds come right behind it. And if these trees were opened up a little bit, it's going to allow the pass through of that wind and, and not blow them over or top them over after heavy, heavy rains. Uh, pruning can also compensate for root loss at planting. Uh, there is a continuing debate. Even research can prove otherwise. So again, you know, uh, we don't necessarily prune each, each, uh, tree that we plant. We kind of leave it as is. Uh, and you know, we're kind of on the, the side of the fence with, with not pruning, but you know, some people do prune when they do it they say it'll increase the root shoot ratio and activate new growth on it now guys we are about halfway through the lecture um and so for like a check on learning i want you to tell me uh the name uh that was termed for you know cutting back trees it's not topping crepe myrtles. And, and actually, the answer is pilarding. Uh, it's going to be one of your quiz questions, and I want you to, to, to know that because this helps the board uh, when they audit me that you guys are actually watching the lecture all the way through. So that's going to be one question. And also, I'm going to tell you a color right now. That's going to be a multiple choice question on your quiz. And the color that I'm thinking about right now is red. So, you know, halfway through the lecture, Eric is talking about the color red. This is the color that I want you to answer on one of your questions for the quiz. So we're about halfway through, uh, and we got quite a few slides to go through. So I'm gonna have to kind of speed up the process. I, like I said, this is a topic that I'm very passionate about and that I love doing. If, if I was going to do anything by myself, you know, if it wasn't landscape design, landscape architecture, um, uh, or lawn care, you know, I could, I could do lawn care by myself, but you know, pruning, I think would be one of the things that I would that I would do nothing like putting on your headphones, turning on some good music and pruning, uh, you know, by hand the correct way and making these shrubs look really good. So now we're going to talk about developing and scheduling a pruning program. Pruning is an intricate part of landscape management and not an interference with other duties. Guys, we prune at the correct time of year. We don't prune when it's convenient and we don't let it get intertwined with other things on we're not going to prune all these shrubs at once just because we're there you know fertilizing we're not we're going to schedule it based on the plant's needs problems will occur when pruning is delayed for other activities or when the landscape supervisor has crews prune just to keep them busy that's not what you want to do now, tree work, maybe, limit up some trees and stuff, but these particular plants, especially plants that bloom, have to be pruned on a schedule, and you need to let your clients know that. Eric, we want our yard pruned. Get over here. Prune it now, and you get there, and it's azaleas that are getting ready to bloom, and they want haircuts given to them. You got to let them know, hey, let's let these plants bloom, and then we'll be back. We can go ahead and cut the rest, but you know, let's save the azaleas for, you know, three weeks and educating the client on these plants will help you develop that pruning schedule. Like I said, you should have a crew probably just dedicated to pruning, depending on the number of properties that you are servicing. But when doing your scheduling and your program, you need to take a site inventory you need to know what's on there. Again, this goes back to plant identification. You need to note all your deciduous shrubs, your evergreen shrubs, your roses, any vines that you may have, the flowering trees, whether there's large or any shade trees on the property, any pine or large conifers, and ground covers. You need to take a complete inventory of the plant materials that you have. Now, this 
plan here might be a little overboard, but there's nothing wrong with going out with your cell phone and taking pictures of the property or a GoPro and videoing it and saying, hey, here's here's my deciduous trees. Here's the dogwoods. Here's the cherries. Here's our azaleas. We have some rhododendron over here. You need to know what's on site. That way you can put together a calendar when these things need to be pruned. You don't send the crew over there, you know, for two days straight pruning everything. You're going to get, you're going to make it look whack and you're not going to allow the plants be in their natural form and you're going against the designer's intent. The intent was for these flowers to bloom. Well, if you cut all the buds off, you're not going to have any blooms. Personnel, ways to handle the pruning. Specialized crews, I just mentioned that, to handle all of the company's prunings. And you can subcontract this crew out to other landscapers if you're running short of work. Pruning is something that a lot of guys and gals don't like to do you could help them out with that. One or more members of a general crew pruning their sites only. So if you're sending out a three or four personnel crew, maybe one person is really trained in pruning and kind of walks around while the other three are doing the mowing. Everyone can prune or you could contract the pruning out. You could, you could sub us out if you like. I love to prune. Or better yet, start your own crew and get that going. Your personnel must be able to identify the plant material. Duh. We've been saying that from, from the beginning of this lecture. Must have an interest in pruning and respect for plants, and they must properly train and have horticultural experience. You can't go to one of the big box stores and buy a pruning book and say, here you go, you're now the pruning supervisor. This is your specialized horticulture um, personnel. They've either got a, you know, certificate, a diploma, or associate's degree, even four-year degree in horticulture, and they must want to do it. Now, let me tell you something. A lot of people don't like to do it. So if you find that one individual that is, you need to keep them busy and keep them happy with the pruning. Uh, and then specialized personnel can prune more efficiently and profitable. Uh, they're, going, they're going to make money for your company. With scheduling, common to use a calendar basis. Weather can modify bloom dates, growth flushes. You gotta, you gotta pay close attention to the weather channel. Far, farmer's Almanac. You need to stay on top of the weather and know what's happening. Schedule Pacific times for pruning according to the current year's growth pattern, and then schedule to meet the needs of as many plants on site as possible to minimize trips and simplify cleanup. Now, the one thing about hand pruning, there is less cleanup. You know, you can lay a tarp down and throw the debris on it. With the hedge clippers, you know, the clippings go everywhere, especially if there's like rock mulch or brick chip mulch. I can't stand that. People never never take the time to clean the stuff out. You have to do that. And then pruning for painting or storms or constructions are not included in your contracts. Remember that. If they call you back for anything uh, other than taking care of the plant's needs, you need to charge them for that. All right. So brush and debris handling, it is the final aspect of pruning. Are you taking it to the landfill? Are you recycling it? And are you using any chippers? Now, here, you know, they've got the hand shears. Now, this plant was designed that way. This was the intent of the designer to make this tree a topiary form. And so that was okay with it. As you can see, there's more debris clippings over there to the right in the turf grass. Most of it's on the tarp, but if you were to hand prune, any type of shrub, you can throw it directly on there and not worry about it being in the turf grass or worse in your pine straw or new mulch or your brick chips or your white rocks. Standards, they come from the International Society of Arboriculture. You know, they have a pruning guideline, especially with the trees. And then there's the American National Standard Institute um, that'll show you how to do that or give you a guide for it. With timing, appropriate pruning, pruning time depends upon the plant, the species, its conditions, and the desired results. Prune plants that flower early in the spring from buds form during the past season, one-year-old wood at the end of their blooming period. 
Prune trees and shrubs that flower during the summer or fall during the dormant season just before growth begins. Prune needle leaf evergreens during the dormant season anytime the wood is not frozen. Prune your larger uh, broadleaf evergreens uh, prized for their flowers just after blooming. And then avoid pruning in late summer when winter damage can be significant. And what we're talking about there is that when you prune, you're always going to generate new growth. So if you prune in the late summer and we're still having a warm summer, new growth is going to generate. And here in North Carolina, guys, where else in the world can you see all four seasons in one day but here? So these plants, you know, they're having to rethink sometimes what they're doing. But if we prune it and they generate that new growth because we've had a, you know, warm summer and then all of a sudden, you know, we get a frost or we get a freeze early on in the fall, that new growth could be damaged. Pruning wounds on trees will close more rapidly if the cuts are made shortly before or just after growth begins. Some trees known as bleeders will lose considerable amounts of sap if pruned uh, in the early spring. This is not harmful, but may be undesirable to the client. And I apologize for that typo there. I shouldn't have hit return. That should have been brought back up there. All right. Now with your equipment, hand pruners, what I grew up learning how to do. There are the draw cut or bypass scissor actions. The one on the left is my favorite. Absolutely love it. Keep a pair on my on my belt at all times. And then we have the anvil pruners. Still a good pair of pruners, uh, but my my favorite is the bypass pruner. Now, here is another check on learning. Which is Eric's favorite hand pruners? Is it the bypass or is it the anvil? Is it loppers or is it a handsaw? Well, you know it to be bypass. This helps us with the board if they audit my classes and see that you guys are watching the lectures. Loppers. They are going to remove limbs up to one inch. Some with larger cutting heads can remove up to two, two and a half inches. Pole pruners, they can remove limbs from one to two and a half inches. They have a curved saw. Uh, I do like these. Uh, it's good to get up there and, and get, you know, branches that are up to two and a half inches, or you can take that saw and cut it out. Now, remember, you know, always use the three, uh, the three cut method when cutting limbs off of trees so many new rookies in the industry want to get that saw right up against the trunk and cut it off and it's going to peel that bark no you've got to cut the weight and then you go back and do your two cuts power pole pruners you know 10 or 12 inch chainsaw uh, can reach from 20 feet off the ground uh, good to have again you still need to use uh, your um uh, your three cut method pruning saws always good to have in the truck again i like i like stuff that's aren't that's not powered everybody's talking about going power electric power and everything what's wrong with a good old 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 school you know right arm or left arm uh power get these get these uh pruning saws out the truck when you can do it used for two inches diameter or larger you'll cut on the draw or pull stroke and unlike a carpenter's saws but you know this uh, uh raptor tooth saw here on the right that thing can go to town and it's good good to have you can keep them in your back pocket while you're pruning or you know in a toolbox and on the truck and you need to have have a pair of these on each of your pruning crews head shears you know there are the handheld units uh like on the left you know used more so in botanical gardens uh with your gas powered or electric units um you know more more and more of these are used every single day uh, and so many uh, rookies in the industry become pruning experts overnight just because they got the new gas powered or electric shears i don't like them guys i don't yes we have to do it 
We have to do it because uh, of time restraints on commercial properties. But if, if you can do it by hand, trust me, you're doing the plant and yourself uh, a big favor. And I, and I hear people discuss this all the time. Eric, people aren't willing to pay for hand pruning. Yes, they are. The right educated client are, are more than happy to pay for it. But your property managers, you know, the people that are on budgets and, and you know, want the stuff done quickly, they don't care. They don't care. And so that's when, you, when you're going to use them. But still, please know how to use these devices uh, the proper way as well. Uh, pruning technique when we're shearing deciduous or evergreen are most frequently pruned for size control shearing results in exceptional exceptional growth of branch side shoots thickening of the interior of the plant to the point where there are no leaves you have branch dieback and thinning of the base plant base plant of the plant done when price and time is a constraint on the budget Except for here, this picture here, again, you know, uh, it's done for formal gardening. But guys, when you shear your plants and, and, and pick out a plant on your property that's been sheared, go and look at it, pull it apart, and look down inside. You're not going to see any green leaves. It's dieback. It starts dying from the inside because no sunlight, no air is able to get down into the plant. And when you cut and you shear these plants, it's kind of like getting a haircut, right? You know, what, what, you know, why in the army do we get haircuts every Friday? It's because the more you cut it, the more growth you get. And so it starts thickening. And then that light is not able to get down in there and it starts dying from within. Bad, bad for the plants. Thinning. Large growing deciduous shrubs require regular, severe pruning to keep them attractive and reasonably contained. Thinning them out inside. Now, if you're going to prune crepe myrtles, this is how you should do it. Don't let all that stuff collect in the middle. Thin it out, and I think your clients will be happy. And if they're not, talk them into removing the crepe myrtle and planting one that's smaller or going back with the smaller shrub. But if they want them pruned, yes, we do it, and you should too. Shrubs with colorful canes such as the red and yellow twig dogwoods, I love them, are best thinned annually after the shrub is three to five years old. That's going to keep the plant looking really well and keeping it looking sharp. With remedial pruning, sometimes we may have to... Um, you know, take over a property that just needs severely pruned. You know, they've been sheared forever. And if we go back and cut these hollies back, that looks like Dorf Burford there, uh, or maybe Needlepoint. If you cut these back, they are going to respond really well. With hedges, during establishment, there is no pruning except heading back the plants at planting. With the head, cut the shoots of broadleaf plants to within four to six inches of their planting height. Head back new shoots a half to two-thirds of their length each time they grow six to 12 inches until they reach the desired height. And then if overgrown, cut back half of the existing height and width. Now, correct shape when you're doing the hedges. You're going to prune to this line, and you're going to form it like this. It's going to be narrower at the top and wider at the bottom that allows sunlight to hit on all sides if you're looking down below the incorrect shape with the prune like this that underneath is not going to get the sunlight and the airflow that it needs it's going to be kind of shaded out with with the tops like this so prune it like this and allow uh, all the light and air to get to it you're going to start seeing um foliage drop and die at the base of the plant and then next thing you know you're going to have a plant on standard that shouldn't be on standard traditional recommendations call for removal of a fourth to a third of the branches and thus potential leaf area of the bare root and bald and burdlap woody plants and planting again i told you we're we don't do that. We kind of leave everything as is. So I put in there, I disagree with. With training, 
pruned routinely the first 10 years of life to avoid severe pruning with older. Exactly. I can't agree with that more. So you, you are checking on these plants, uh, you know, two or three times throughout the year when you have the contract and pruning uh, on a routine basis before they get overly grown. X current. This is your central leader growth. Uh, it'll be like on a uh, pin oak or shamardi oak. D current. There's multiple leader growth on like a maple or an ash. Uh, and sometimes you know you may have multiple leaders that you may want to cut out on certain trees. Here's what we're talking about with the three cuts. Do not practice flush cutting. Not good. Not good. You want to protect. You want to protect that branch collar. And so cut one is right here, and that's going to allow that to drop. And then, then you're going to come and cut number two, and you're going to cut it right there. And then the three cut is going to be right through here. That gets all that weight off of it, and so that is an easy cut. It's not, if you were to cut all the way through here, it's going to pull, and you may lose bark right there, but you want to protect that branch collar. Oh, uh, with pruning paint and wound dressing, do not reduce, they do not reduce decay or speed the closure. There's no value in preventing uh, insect or disease infestations with this um, pruning paint. Here we're going to see pollarding. Well, this is topping. This is the topping. Um, topping is the indiscriminate cutting of major limbs to stubs without regard of their location. Now, I absolutely hate this. And this usually what happens with the crepe myrtles. Uh, and it, again, you know, they'll be talking about this long after I'm dead and gone. So, uh, you know, do what you need to do, guys. It's okay to, to cut the crepe myrtles. But you definitely don't want to do a willow oak like the picture up top. That is butchering. That is butchering. And then you're going to have all this flush of growth like you are here with the, the bottom right picture. Looks horrible. Looks horrible. You know, um, I know municipalities, you know, require that. You know, we see the lamp post in the street light right behind that tree. That may have been why they had to do it. Um, but it shouldn't have been planted there to begin with. Go with something a lot smaller. Pilarding, here's the next picture. Uh, here's a picture at Renolda Gardens, you know, just down the street from campus. Uh, we've got some students, graduates working there at Renolda Gardens, but they pilard uh, the trees there in their courtyard, uh, and they use it as a history lesson, just like I was telling you. You know, our ancestors did it for particular reasons. They did it. For firewood, they did it to warm the house in the winter, to cool it in the summer. And so basically, before you pollard, the trees are going to look like this, and you're going to cut it back to the knots each time. And, you know, I love this because it is a history lesson, and I'm a big history buff. So when it comes to horticulture history, uh, this is a good place to actually go and see the pollarding. When you're going to, you know, Keep your trees in the fasti, uh, I can never say this name, so make fun of me if you want to, but the fastigiot uh, type shrubs and trees, uh, you're going to prune for this. They're going to have that columnar or upright form. The branches turn sharply upward and grow parallel with little or no horizontal development. And some of these look very, very cool. I mean, I do like it. So we're, we're pruning it to maintain this form. Again, it's the intent of the designer. They seldom need pruning, and if they're pruned, uh, direct growth inward rather than outward. So you're going to make sure that it grows inward. With your weeping trees, your decumbent weeping forms, uh, you know, here's the cherry. You know, a lot of people will want to keep this pruned right here to give it that umbrella shape instead of letting it hang all the way to the, to the ground, you know. Just depends on, you know, preference there. And then with large conifers, you know, here is uh, a sample of the pine 
and just the uh, uh, area to prune in. You know, you've got your terminal bud, your lateral buds, your needle fascicle, uh, your undeveloped fascicular buds, and you do not want to prune, uh, you know, below that. You're going to prune within that area. So with wound closure and treatment, cot it or coat it, compartmentalization of decay in trees. Um, you know, this is bark penetrating injury contained with a two-step process, the accumulation of antimicrobial substances. Uh, they will produce physical barriers to decay. Uh, the vertical barrier keeps decay movement up and down. Annual growth ring compartmentalizes the inward movement. And then the ray cells decay in check. And then the wound, wound will wood over uh, the actual wound. And so guys, that is, we're right at 50 minutes, which, uh, what the licensing board requires for a one hour class, uh, course. Uh, so thank you for joining us for, uh, do you know how to prune course number two, one, six, three, and, uh, for another check on learning, uh, I want you to write down, um, the color blue. You're, you're going to answer a question that has, uh, you know, what was, what was the color Eric was talking about at the end of the lecture? Now, these questions that I've done uh, for check on learnings, these are questions that will be in your quiz, and the only way you're going to know the answers is if you watch the lecture. Now, a lot of you guys are smart, super educated landscape contractors. The, the other questions you're going to be able to answer on your own because they're common sense questions about pruning. But with the check on learning, you're going to actually have to watch the lecture. So, guys, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for uh, joining me with uh, Do You Know How to Prune? And I will see you in the next lecture.